Welcome everyone to another Sunday. Welcome to our second service online. We're really glad that you could join us again here, same time, same place. Uh, we are glad that we're going to be continuing with the Grace series this week. Uh, we are excited that last week we were able to start off and kick off our series. And we are actually excited about everyone who was able to join us and all the response that we received over this past week. Uh, this week we'll have Christine and the band leading us again through worship and we will have Kwesi taking us through the second message on grace uh, which will be coming on a bit later. That being said, I would like to hand over the service in prayer to God. Um, so let us all close our eyes and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just grateful that we can meet again like this on another Sunday. We're grateful for your body, we're grateful for community, we're grateful for fellowship and all the avenues you've made available to us during this period of time. Father God, we continually look to you and we continually look to the cross uh, because it is from that that we draw our strength. That is where we get our hope, that is where we get our strength and comfort. Father God, I pray that even as we interact over this service, may your Holy Spirit touch our hearts and speak to us in a unique and special way. Father God, we continually proclaim your truths and we pray that we may be people who proclaim your truths wherever it is that we are. Not just online, but in our interactions with our friends and families, wherever it is that we find ourselves. Father God, we pray that this service um, may be impactful and we hand it over to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. On that note, I would just like to hand over this, uh, to Christine and the band who will lead us through a time of praise and worship. Over to you, Christine. Good morning, God's tribe. Let's enter into worship together. You can stand up where you are, you can sing along with us, you can dance along, whatever you feel like doing. Let's just offer up a worship and praise to the Lord this morning together. There's no sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name have I ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter
you that, that you encourage us to sing to you, Jesus. That you encourage us to express ourselves in worship, Jesus. That you encourage us to make loud noises in worship and to be quiet in worship, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you embrace the, the nature of humanity and that we are just, we're all over the place, God. But no matter where we are in our emotions, in our life, in our, in our understanding, that we can always find a space to worship in you in that place, God. Thank you that if we're feeling depressed today, Jesus, we can still praise you. If we're feeling grateful and blessed today, Jesus, we can praise you for that too. Lord, help us to find the praise within ourselves to just to worship you in this time, Lord Jesus. We love you and we thank you for your presence here this morning. Thanks so much, Christine, for that wonderful time in praise and worship. I believe uh, all of us uh, connected today were blessed by it. Now, just we're going to move on to a few announcements that we have this Sunday. Uh, the first announcement, similar to what we mentioned last week Sunday uh, on life groups, this is just a reminder again that we should remain connected over this period of time uh, through the various life groups. Uh, that being said, there's a number on your screen right now which you can reach out to to find out more details about a life group in your area and who you can connect to um, to remain uh, within part of 
uh, the body during this period of time where we cannot actually meet face to face. The second announcement is actually an acknowledgement that we are going through tough times uh, with COVID and that being said we've actually as a church uh, come together and said let us join hands uh, in support of people especially who cannot provide for themselves for one reason or another over this period of time. Uh, we have a committee, a benevolence committee, which uh, will reach out to you through various messages on various groups and it's just a rally call for all of us to be able to join hands and um, give during this period of time where great where need has where the need has become greater uh, that being said I believe that there'll be uh, different people who want to give in different ways whether it's in substance or in kind whether it's giving money or giving food um, in any way shape or form we would really appreciate uh, whatever it is that you're able to give during this period of time Currently, there are details on the screen for someone in the Benevolence Committee uh, who you can reach out to if you would like to support during this period of time. We are grateful and we are thankful that God has been able to provide uh, for us during this period of time and we are also excited at the opportunity for us to be able to give back and to support people who need it in this time and in this season. Our next announcement is on offering. Uh, we are thankful for the people who uh, remain committed and have been giving as a church. We are very grateful. This is how we give thanks for uh, what it is God has placed in our hands. Um, we believe that the Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts and let us be even more generous. We believe that we worship God through our giving and we are thankful that uh, we have another opportunity this Sunday to give back to the wonderful work that we carry on doing within the church. Uh, and we continually remain and impact uh, our communities over this period of time. That being said, we have details on the screen for you to give, whether it's through bank transfers or through mobile money. We welcome you to take down the details that are currently on your screen and feel free to give uh, in whatever way, shape or form you can give. And we are thankful for your commitment and the commitment that remains uh, to the church. I would now like to welcome Kwesi, who will be taking us through the second part of the Grace Series, which we currently have running. Uh, over to you, Kwesi, for your message this Sunday. Good morning, Ghost Tribe. It's a joy to be with you this morning. I hope you and your loved ones are all doing well, especially at a time like this. Uh, we are really fortunate that we can still gather, even in this fashion, when we are not able to meet physically. We are still going through our series in Grace. Uh, we started last week learning about the gift of grace and how that is such a wonderful blessing for us. Today, we're going to go on and we look at the second part of that and understand how grace teaches us to say no to sin. Now, that's a very important thing because if grace is such an important gift from God, then the question is, how are we using it? How is it changing our lives? Now, grace teaching us to say no to sin is where our life really turns around and we hopefully start to show the difference uh, in that spirit that has been deposited in us. If you think about saying no to sin, sometimes what comes to mind? We would think about things that may serve as a deterrent. One of the things that will come to mind is for instance that probably the risk and the fear of getting caught can stop people and at least hinder them from getting into sin. But you will realize that it doesn't always happen. Take an example of a young man or a young woman uh, that are in a relationship in the church, they are well known, but they are struggling with purity uh, in that relationship. Well, sexual sin has a way of uh, sometimes being obvious because it can lead to pregnancy and I would argue that is impossible to hide. But what happens then is possibly in some scenarios it could deter some from you know, doing what the scriptures are telling us not to do. But there are also cases where you realize that unfortunately the devil sears our conscience as scripture tells us. And people actually start to feel that playing with the limits of what we can and cannot do 
is supposed to be exciting, strangely enough. And what happens is we start trying to find out how far can we actually go without um, actually uh, crossing the limits um, in that sense. Well, as you can see, that doesn't really help us in terms of saying no to sin because we are dabbling in the sin at that point. Another thing that might come to mind is rules. If you think about it, there are rules everywhere. Uh, and for, for Christians, broadly speaking, we would say the law of God. We have the law and it's a wonderful thing that we have. But the law in itself, as a list of guidelines, uh, is not enough. Yes, it can point us in certain directions, but it's not enough to get us there. Well, why is that? Well, I think the Bible actually tells us something about this. So join me as we look quickly at this uh, from the book of Romans, uh, verses 2 and 3. What does it say? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh. I want to make sure you didn't miss that part. What did it say the law was? That the law was powerless to set us free. Imagine us. We've all been kids at some point. If you have children in your life, what does it mean to have a set of rules? Well, they see it only as something to be broken for the most part. And most of us are not very different. So I think where we are seeing in these examples is that in actual fact, these things may be helpful to us in our walk of sanctification at certain times, but they are not the ultimate solution. But praise God that there is a solution. And that solution was given to us in the Lord. And that's why we see that grace indeed is powerful. We see this in the scripture we'll be spending some time on today, in the book of Titus, particularly chapter 2, verse 12. And it says this, that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Teaching in the sense of instructing. So there is a process of actually sending us to that point that we know enough of this to be able to act on it. That enough has changed in our lives that we can respond to it. That is the beauty of the message of the gospel. So I say again that grace is powerful. Now why is that? One of the songs that we've sung this morning is a wonderful old hymn that says, Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. It is only possible to overcome sin by the grace of God. That grace that the Lord has given us is what is going to push us through from step to step. We will be looking at this passage in a little more detail. And particularly in chapter 2, we will be spending time on verses 11 to 14. So take your Bibles or your phones or iPads or whatever you're reading with and read along with me. We're in the book of Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 14. And it reads, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is a wonderful scripture. It is so encouraging that we can look at scripture and see that this is all there. It's a gift. So we're going to look at it in a few parts this morning. The first part is grace offers salvation through Jesus Christ. Well, how does grace do that? Let's see what the scripture tells us. So back to the passage we were just reading. If you take a closer look at verse 11, it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. 
For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. We just celebrated Easter a few weeks ago. So I'm sure it's not very far in, in either of our minds the, the, the work that Christ did for us. I mean, the amazing part about it is he left the corridors of heaven, he descended into the world as a man, and he went on to live a sinless life, was cruelly crucified, was buried, but praise God, he resurrected on that third day. Now that is part of why we have hope. But in that redemptive act that Christ did, he made it possible for us to have the gift of grace. The, the verse says that grace of God has appeared. Now the word translated appeared is the same word we get in English called epiphany. Epiphany meaning an experience of sudden and striking revelation. A realization that almost comes out of nowhere. Well, if you think closely about it, grace is very much like that. For us as Christians, grace was unexpected. We didn't know the state that we were in. But due to the perfect plan of God, who knew the end from the beginning, who knew the people that he wanted to take out of darkness into his marvelous light, he executed this plan of redemption. And that's why grace for us is like a light bulb coming on in a place of extreme darkness that has been going on for a while. And when that light comes, we can rejoice because there is true transformation. That is what we are reminded of when the scripture says the grace of God has appeared uh, in this fashion. We see actually, if you look further down at verse 14, and verse 14 says, who gave himself, referring to Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself uh, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Christ did this redemptive exercise. God's grace has been made available to everyone. As this uh, verse also tells us, that God has appeared, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It has been offered to all of us. So the question I have for you, yes you, is has that transformation happened in your life? Have you seen the grace of God appear in your life in a way that causes and triggers a change? Well, if it hasn't happened yet, then I would expect that hopefully as we speak on today, you will get a better realization that you want to give your life to this Lord that we are talking about. Because there is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you don't know him yet, I commend him to you this morning. And it is my prayer that you get to taste and to see that indeed he is good and he's deserving uh, to be our Lord and Savior. We go on to the second part of what we are looking at um, in our passage today. We go into verse 12. Verse 12 says this. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So that's what we're looking at as our second point. Living self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. When grace appears in your life, your life changes forever. Now, if you didn't know this, think back to the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus. Scripture tells us clearly that there is a transformation that happens. But we all know that that transformation is not physical. It is indeed spiritual. Now, if you look at what um, Scripture continues to tell us in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed. Behold, the new has come. This passage was actually written to a people who needed to hear this when Apostle Paul wrote it. The letter was meant for Titus, who from what we learn in this letter, was the first pastor of the first church in the island of Crete. 
Now, the Cretans were considered quite an ungodly people. In fact, a poet called Epimenides famously said, and you find it actually in chapter 1, verse 12, that all Cretans are liars. And it turns out they weren't actually just liars. If you read further through this letter, we see that they are lazy, they are glutinous, they are rebellious, they are loveless, they are argumentative sinners. But to be fair, if we think about it a little bit more, we realize that they are not very different from us today. So how does the Lord change that part of us? That is where that transformation that was mentioned, that new creation comes in. And that transformation indeed makes sure that we see a different part of our lives. So, like Jesus told Nicodemus, you don't need to go back into your mother's womb. You are not changing your physical bodies. But spiritually, we are being transformed. Spiritually, we are being transformed. I hope you said an amen to that. One way that we see this is how we deal with self-control. It's always very nice for us to think, I think I'm quite good at self-control. It's a nice thing to say, it's a cool thing to say in conversations, especially within Christian circles. But you have to realize that the moment that we are actually faced with a situation where we have to say no, that's when we realize that our self-control disappears into thin air. Now you have to realize that saying no doesn't just happen. We have to be trained to say no. This is why the scripture says that grace teaches us to say no to sin. And the word also means instruct. We are being instructed to say no to sin. That is something that grace does because we are being walked through that process of sanctification by the grace of God and through the work of the Holy Spirit. To say no can only happen through the grace of God. We can't just think we do this in our own mind. But the Lord doesn't leave us alone. We are not left to our own devices. He understands the seriousness of the temptation that we are facing. And that's why the word that is translated no, in actually some uh, other translations you will see, it's called renounce. So it's a fierce term that indicates the seriousness of what the Lord is pointing us to and instructing us to do around resisting. So you realize here that self-control and saying no is not a passive exercise. It is very much an active exercise. So if you are playing around with sin, you can see it right there in your bosom, close by, and you think it's not so bad. It's like kid playing with fire. That's when we give the devil a foothold. But scripture is telling us here that we say no in a very clear, emphatic, and firm way. And we can do that in the Lord because Christ has given us a way. Let's see the encouragement that scripture presents to us on this as well. I, you know, invite you to read with me 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Hopefully you've come across this scripture before and it's very much an encouragement to me. And this is what it says. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. I say that again. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God is so gracious that he understands the challenges, the fight that we have against fleshly desires and the work of the Spirit in our lives. And that's why we need to ensure that we allow the Spirit to work in our lives. The scripture says that keep in step with the Spirit. When we give our lives to the Lord, He gives us a deposit of His Spirit. And that's part of how we can win and triumph 
in this particular battle. Because the work is finished by Christ. All we are supposed to do is to tap into that excellent work that he's done. But you see, we can't do this by ourselves. And this is one of the reasons it's important for us to remember that part of that deposit of the Spirit that is in us calls us to make sure that we allow the Spirit to lead the way. If the Spirit is leading the way, then we are confident that we can fight that battle with fleshly desires and hopefully come out on top by God's grace. In this season of isolation, it can be a difficult time in dealing with sin. Imagine the sins that we commit, as we say, in our closet. When you have time to yourself, your mind can play dangerous games with you. So let us all be cautious during this time. We have extra time on our hands and the devil always finds a way to turn us in different directions. Let us make sure we use these times well. So my encouragement is that let us delve deeper into the things of God. We are talking about how we can make sure we transform that self-control into living godly lives and actually living lives that are faithful before the Lord. We do that by making sure we don't give up and drop on our spiritual disciplines. So now that you have extra time on your hands, you're spending a bit more time at home, can you tell yourself honestly that you're spending more time in prayer? You're spending more time in your study of the word? Well, if you're not, then this is a reminder that let us not give any chance to the devil to send us in the wrong direction, but let us hold fast to this God who has been a transformation in our lives. The other thing that we don't want to lose sight of is gathering with believers because the scripture encourages us. It commends this to us. It's a unique part of our Christian walk. In fact, we remind ourselves often that our walk in the Lord is not one of individuality. It is one of community. Now, yes, community these days looks different. We may not meet physically, but we can definitely meet virtually. There are many ways that we can be in each other's lives, even at a time like this. So let me encourage you that at God's tribe, we have our life groups that are an excellent way to stay connected with a smaller group of people, to be encouraged, to make sure we grow in the word together. If you don't have one, connect to one. Also, we have men's prayer meetings, women's prayer meetings that are going on. Are you part of any of them? These are times when we can build each other up. So do not despise these opportunities because who knows? After COVID-19 passes, would you ever get the extra time you've had on your hands at this point? And when we are to answer for it, what would you say you did with that time that you got? It is my prayer that we will use this and we will use it wisely. Because of that finished work, we can say clearly, just like we were talking about uh, the Cretans, that yes, we've been transformed. And we are definitely on that path, fighting that battle to make sure that we win against sin. In fact, Romans 8 says it in very encouraging ways. And there are a few of them that come to mind. That we are no longer slaves to sin. Amen. In fact, because we have been set free from sin, we are rather to become slaves to righteousness. That is what we want to give our lives to. That is what you and I want to dedicate our lives to the Lord for, so that we can see this happening. So that when we say confidently that we have said no to laziness in this time, we have said no to procrastination, we have said no to all sorts of uh, lustful temptations, then we know that the Spirit is working on our lives. I hope you said amen to that. This is what we expect to happen in our lives as we depend on the finished work of Christ. Let us move on to our final point. 
And that is where this all hopefully comes together for us. And that one is waiting for the blessed hope. Waiting for the blessed hope. We see this in verse 13. But before verse 13, we realize that verse 12 that we were just talking about tells us that grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. But then 13 comes in. And then it says this, While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So you see how it builds in. That blessed hope is the final piece of saying no to sin. But it is only because we have used grace to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And we've dedicated our lives to being self-controlled, upright, and godly. But you do that when you set your eyes on that hope. And that is why verse 13 is so important. What is that hope? Like it tells us, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior Christ is coming back again. If you were not sure about that, let me remind you. He's told us several times about this. In fact, he did say that I'm going to prepare a place for you. When I come back, I'm going to take you and that you will dwell with me. And this is a dwelling of eternity. Why are we so sure that Christ is coming back? Well, because if you look at scripture, everything else that he said to this date has come to pass. So we are very confident and we're very joyful and hopeful of that day for it to come. But we have to realize that that is one thing that causes us to have a different perspective on life. It means we don't look at the now. It means that we look at eternity. God does not lie. In fact, in this very Titus, at the very beginning, in verse 2, it tells us, the God who does not lie. Well, I pray that you've seen that God and you've realized and experienced that truth that is about him. If we go further, we see that in doing this, we are actually following an example that Christ set for us. Let's spend some time in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. In verse 2 of Hebrews, chapter 12, it says this, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus showed us how to set our eyes on that eternal hope. Because it tells us that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That painful, torturous process. He endured it because he knew what was ahead. Well. What is our story? Are we saying that life is too hard? That living through this broken world is too difficult? And so because of that, we will give in to the temptations of this world? Rather than look at that blessed hope that is ahead of us? My brother, my sister, I encourage you that this is not the time to give up. The reason is because Christ has done it. And he is the one that we are looking to spend that time with. Let's see another reminder of this. In Revelation 21, verse 3 to 4, it says this. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. Or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. The old order of things has passed away. In these times of COVID-19, we might say there's a lot of pain, suffering, death going on all around the world and getting very close to us. But there is a hope. 
that no matter how broken our world may be, no matter how torn apart it may seem to us, and sometimes maybe even feel hopeless, powerless in these situations, well, praise God that we have something to look forward to. A time when there will be no more pain, when there will be no more suffering, when there will be no more death. That is what we have to look forward to. A very popular missionary called Jim Elliot once said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I say it again. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The wisdom in this statement is that we should not try to hold on to the things of this world. Why? Because we can't. Because they perish. And scripture tells us that. They fall apart. They decay. We should rather spend our energies and our hearts on the things that are eternal. That is holding fast to the finished work of Christ. That work, that is a work of eternity. So that we can spend eternity with Him in heaven. That is something when we've been gifted with, we cannot lose. We thank God that He's made this possible for us. And that we can piece it all together from starting from the appearance of grace, from it teaching and instructing us to say no to sin, from that transformative work of Christ helping us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives, to what we can now do that we live through this present age while we are waiting for that blessed hope. That is the message that God is telling us about this morning. And I hope that we are all very well instructed, knowing that indeed we can do it only through Him. And He's faithful never to leave us or forsake us. Let's pray. Our dear Lord, we thank you and we bless your name because you deserve to be exalted. We thank you for the gift of your grace, that free gift that we've been blessed with, that has been so transformative in our lives. We pray that as your word has instructed us to do this morning, that we will be able to live by it and let it point us in that way that leads to your heavenly home. We pray that even as we strive to do that in this time, in a chaotic, painful time, that you will heal our land, that you will care for us, and that you will cause us to be protected from all these infirmities. We pray that this will be our portion and that we will have a testimony now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kwesi, for that encouraging message on grace. We are encouraged that it is the grace of God that continually transforms us and teaches us to say no to sin. Just a few reminders before we go on uh, the announcements made earlier on. The first announcement was on life groups. Kindly reach out if you aren't already connected to any life group. But if you are, uh, another encouragement and reminder to remain connected to life groups uh, over this coming week. Another reminder uh, is that we have a benevolence committee with details currently on your screen. Kindly take them down and if you're in interested and um, in moved to be able to share something with someone over this period of time or to donate whatever it is you can, kindly reach out and kindly um, get in contact with one of the people and they will be able to assist on how and where to give. And finally, we just want to remind you that kindly remind everyone or share this link. Uh, we want as many people as possible to be connected with us over this period of time. We are glad that we have seen you or rather you have connected with us over this Sunday and we hope to see more of you again next Sunday as we carry on in our series of grace. Thank you and enjoy your week.